Hello, I'm JJ3. Uh, I'm going to read you an article called How to Understand the Monetary System. The reason the global monetary system survives is largely thanks to the public's blissful ignorance of exactly how it works. To paraphrase one familiar analogy, if you knew how sausage was made, would you still eat it? It's probably safe to say that the vast majority of the world's citizens have no clue that the integrity of the currency they work for, save and use as a medium of exchange every day, rests on nothing more tangible than the respective government's authority to and solemn promise to tax them in the future. <clears throat> it is well that the people of a nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. That's from Ford Motor Company founder, Henry Ford. The first thing you need to understand about our modern global monetary system is that all currencies in the world today are fiat currencies. And all fiat currencies are designed to lose value. Before our all fiat currency system. Once upon a time, the U.S. dollar and many of the other currencies now in existence derived their value from the gold stored in national treasuries. In effect, each unit of currency was a sort of IOU to the holder, signifying it was backed by a like amount of gold. As described in Michael Maloney's book, Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver, <clears throat> before the Federal Reserve was created, each U.S. Treasury note, paper dollar, was fully backed by gold or silver. When the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913, the amount of gold backing each dollar was reduced to just 40% of the face value of existing currency. All right, stay with me. In effect, this allowed the U.S. government to increase the amount of currency it could create and spend by 60%, enabling deficit spending for World War I and the accompanying increase of the currency supply. So in essence, in order to fund a war, that is why they created the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> Then in 1934, the U.S. government devalued the dollar by 41% by raising the price of gold from 20.67 per ounce, the price established in 1834, to $35 per ounce. Now what this did, this revaluation of the dollar raised the value of the gold held at the U.S. Treasury so that it once again matched the total value of base money. This is 1934, or all the dollars then in circulation. In effect, the U.S. dollar was once again fully backed by gold. For many years, the government of the world's developed nations more or less cooperated under the Bretton Woods International Monetary System to keep the price of gold at $35 per ounce by selling gold into the open market. Under the Bretton Woods system, the U.S. dollar was designated the world's reserve currency. Okay, this is important. That's what made the U.S. what it is today. <clears throat> Most other nations pegged their currencies to the dollar, and the U.S. in return agreed to redeem U.S. dollars in gold at the rate of $35 per ounce. Under this Bretton Woods, the world essentially was on the dollar standard. Okay? Gave us a lot of control over the world. But the Bretton Woods system turned out to be not up to the complexities of a modern global economy. The currency supply was once again inflated to fund World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and President Lyndon B. Johnson's social programs. Americans, America's foreign policy increasingly meant spending lots of dollars in other countries on foreign aid, defense, and military spending and international investment in trade. As a result, lots more dollars flowed into the treasuries of other nations, and much less capital flowed back into the U.S. Treasury, resulting in imbalances. This is kind of what Ron Paul talks about, why we should pull out from policing the world. It's expensive. From the 1950s on, the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve undertook a series of interventions in the free market, 
designed to bring the U.S. monetary system back into balance. <clears throat> As always ultimately happens, whenever authorities interfere with the workings of the free market, for every action taken, there are unintended and usually destructive consequences. Long-term interest rates kept artificially low encouraged foreign borrowing and discouraged domestic investment. Yes, our rates have been low for the past three years. To counter French President Charles de Gaulle, who had a bone to pick with the United States, opposed the use of the dollar of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. France began buying up dollars and redeeming them in gold, seriously depleting the supply of gold in the U.S. Treasury. Okay, you can find out that on uh, HistoryCentral.com if you want to learn more about that. By the end of the 1960s, it was clear that the ills plaguing the international monetary system and the American dollar would have to be addressed at a basic level. <clears throat> The Kennedy and Johnson administrations had applied solutions to the mounting balance of payments crisis that were at, be at best patch-up jobs, postponements of the inevitable. <clears throat> the balance of payments was off balance. The dollar was overvalued. Inflation was picking up speed, and the United States could do little to restore economic order without compromising major aspects of domestic and foreign policy. Okay, this is by the end of the 1960s. In the end, the United States was not able to meet its commitment to the rest of the world under the Bretton Woods system <clears throat> to keep the U.S. dollar pegged to gold at the rate of $35 per ounce. The bottom line is that Bretton Woods did not allow the United States the flexibility, read the ability to create as much currency as it needed to fund its foreign and domestic policy goals, okay, because it was tied to 35 an ounce. And that, when they took that away in 1971, um, well, you'll see. By 1971, the United States was essentially bankrupt. It did not have enough gold in the Treasury to redeem all the dollars in circulation. That year, President Nixon severed the link between the U.S. dollar and gold. With his act, in effect, every currency in the world, thanks to the dollar status as the world's reserve currency, became fiat currency. Now, fiat currency is not backed by gold or any other tangible asset. The only thing backing fiat currency is the good faith of the people, faith that the value of the currency will be sustained by a government's future taxing of its taxpayers. Ironic, isn't it? As Michael Maloney wrote up in his book, a fiat is an arbitrary decree, order, or pronouncement given by a person, group, or body with the absolute authority to enforce it. A currency that derives its value from declaratory fiat or an authoritative order of the government is by definition a fiat currency. Okay, Yawn, I know. Stay with me. Now, unencumbered by U.S. and world monetary policy, the free market bid the price of gold up until in 1980 when gold reached $850 per ounce before falling. The value of the gold held at the U.S. Treasury exceeded the total value of base money, the total of dollars in circulation, plus all the dollars existing in the form of outstanding revolving credit. Wow. At WealthCycles.com, we measure the amount of currency in circulation by adding the number of dollars in circulation and in bank reserves, bank money, to the total of dollars represented by outstanding revolving credit, which is mostly in the form of unpaid credit card balances. That's because whenever you charge a purchase to your credit card, in effect, new currency is created in the amount of your charge. That new currency stays in circulation until you pay off your credit card balance. In many ways, credit cards are replacing cash as a medium of exchange and must be included in measuring the total cash and its digital equivalent in our modern-day monetary system. So basically what they're saying is credit is now becoming cash. So every time, 
I charge something to my credit card, the credit card can now lend against that and then lend against it again up to nine times. All right, so the shaky foundation of the modern monetary system. But in all likelihood, 99.9% .9 of the world's population doesn't have a clue about the shaky ground on which the world's monetary system, our fiat currency system, rests. Many people still believe that the U.S. dollar is backed up by gold sitting in a vault at Fort Knox. Most have no idea that the only thing that backs every currency in the world right now, including the U.S. dollar, is debt and the solemn promise of each government to tax its citizens in the future to pay that debt. In the United States, this promise is called a treasury bond. <laughs> That's what we have about 15 trillion of. Uh, should government refrain from regulation, taxation, the worthlessness of the money becomes apparent and the fraud can no longer be concealed. <laughs> That's by John Maynard uh, Keynes in Consequences of Peace. However, the overwhelming ignorance and confusion about how our monetary system works is changing. The global financial crisis shook things up, got people's attention, forced many people to take a closer look. In our information society, the public is becoming educated faster and knowledge is spreading quicker than at any time in history. And as the information gets out there, people's faith in all currencies, especially the U.S. dollar, will be shaken to the core. All right, uh, that's pretty much as far as I can go. But um, this is at marketoracle.co.uk, article 33507. I'll put a link uh, in the video so you can go there and read the article for yourself. But uh, I just thought it was interesting. It's a pretty good exp explanation of the history of our monetary system that's led us to where we're at today. And uh, as you can see, we're in, we're in quite a bind. So anyways, m my intention is just to inform you because I feel like if you're not angry, then you're not informed. All right. Thanks for listening.